Hello, my name is Andy Catcher at NOFAS, the National Organization on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome, and I'd like to welcome you all to this edition of the NOFAS webinar series. And we have a series of webinars uh, monthly, and the full schedule and uh, a list of past webinars is available on the NOFAS website. So I encourage everyone to check that out at uh, www.nofas.org. And once you're there, there's a yellow button uh, that goes to the webinar page. Um, and there's a page for the NoFast webinar series with a description. And there's some recordings of past webinars and more information uh, there. So uh, we have a great webinar today um, on the topic of when someone with an FASD is arrested, what you need to know. And this is going to go over a lot of really helpful, practical information about some practical steps that people can take um, when a family member or someone uh, with FASD uh, is arrested or comes into contact with the criminal justice system. And uh, it's a topic that uh, has been much interest to a lot of uh, people in the FASD community. Uh, no fast, we get messages, emails, phone calls all the time from people asking uh, for assistance or information uh, regarding uh, someone with an FASD that's uh, in trouble with the law. So it's great to be able to bring this information to everyone uh, in the NOFAS community. And uh, a recording, a video recording of the webinar will be available on the NOFAS, we uh, the NOFAS website within 24 hours of the conclusion of this webinar. So I'd just like to uh, briefly introduce the presenter uh, for the webinar, which is uh, who's Dr. Paul Connor. Uh, Dr. Paul Connor is a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist, and he specializes in cognitive and behavioral assessments of individuals with a variety of uh, impairments, including fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, uh, among some other conditions. And uh, Dr. Connor has a PhD in clinical psychology, and um, he specializes in uh, clinical psychology, neuropsychology, and uh, is a an expert uh, on FASD, has some uh, really great information. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Paul Connor to uh, make his presentation. All right. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I've been in the field of FASD now since about 1995 when I started my internship. At, uh, or postdoctoral fellowship, sorry, at the University of Washington Fetal Alcohol and Drug Unit with uh, Dr. Ann Streisguth. And throughout that time, we'd been uh, hearing a lot about, even, even back in the 90s, we'd been hearing a lot about individuals with FASDs that were getting into troubles with the law. And so that was very much a focus of what we were doing uh, 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 throughout our time doing research. And as I've transitioned from research practice into clinical practice, that's a, a fairly large portion of the work that I do uh, as well, uh, is doing assessments of individuals that have uh, come into contact with the law. Um, it, it's important kind of at the outset to say, to, to make a couple of caveats. Not every person with FASD is going to get into trouble with the law. It's not something that is you know, 100% guaranteed. There is definitely a large subset of people with FASD that do get into trouble with the law. And in those cases, it's very important that, uh, that the court system understands FASD and is able to um, appropriately interact with people that have fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Because they, they function very differently than a normally developing person who's in trouble with the law. And, um, there are a lot more pitfalls that, that occur. Um, let's see, I should say that uh, there have been apparently a couple of comments so far that, there, uh, that some of the attendees are going to want to uh, um, uh, get copies of the slides. Uh, I will go ahead and uh, create a PDF version of these slides that I will um, send to Andy, and then it can be disseminated from there. So I'll do that after the webinar today. So getting started, if I can get my computer to work. Um, in general, the, free, the prevalence of FASD uh, around the world uh, in just the general population is unfortunately extremely high. Uh, in the study that was done in Seattle uh, beginning in the 1970s uh, and following these individuals throughout their lives, we found that the rate of both FAS 
and ARND, the full spectrum of FASDs, at about 1%. Certainly there are parts of the world where the rates are much higher. Um, we've uh, had research uh, over the years from uh, Russia, uh, the orphanages in Moscow, as well as um, from South Africa in the uh, wine producing uh, portion of South Africa, that the rates of FAS alone, just the physical features of FAS, are extremely high, between 5 and 8 percent of the, of the population down there. Um, Phil May recently published a, uh, uh, estimates of prevalence in the U.S. and in Western Europe at about 2 to 5 percent of the population have one form of an FASD. So it's unfortunately extremely common um, just in the general population. Now, probably most of you have seen uh, a variation of this slide. This is uh, the research that was done by Dr. Streiskuth back in the mid-90s, and I came onto the pro onto, into the uh, fetal alcohol and drug unit just as this study was getting going. So I was involved with that uh, from a fairly early time period. And this slide is talking about um, the different uh, secondary disabilities or um, uh, difficulties that a person with FASD experiences during the course of their life. Um, one of those is mental health uh, problems, and uh, the research has shown that it's, it's nearly ubiquitous that uh, the majority and almost all of the individuals with FASD have, have had mental health difficulties in their life. But it also uh, studied disrupted school experiences, being expelled, suspended, dropping out of school, and a number of other areas, including confinement, being uh, hospitalized uh, for mental health, substance use issues, or incarcerated, and also inappropriate sexual behavior. And, but when it comes to trouble with the law, and this, you'll notice, uh, includes individuals that are from the age of six up, even in that very young age throughout uh, life, we're seeing rates of about a little over 40 percent. And, you know, that's taking into account that uh, children age six are probably a lot less likely to get into trouble with the law. So if we look more at age, 20, age 12 on up, so uh, uh, juvenile uh, and adolescents, we see that the rate of trouble with the law is about 60 percent in this sample so exceedingly high. Um, not everybody that uh, gets in trouble with the law is convicted of a crime, uh, but still about a third of these individuals uh, in the study had been convicted. Um, FASD, uh, the types of crimes that people with FASD get involved with are very much the majority tend to be uh, crimes against persons, uh, assaults, and things like that. Uh, and then uh, the rates drop accordingly as we move down to other uh, sorts of troubles with the law, including legal system processes, like uh, uh, which I think may be a little bit low, uh, judging by the experiences that I've had. These are uh, parole violations and things like that, where they end up getting back into troubles with the law uh, because they're not able to follow probation appropriately. Um, and it's important to note that it, F, troubles with the law occur across the spectrum of, of FASDs. So this slide is talking about the individuals with FAS, those with the facial features of FAS, um, and those with, back in the 90s when we were calling them FAE, so these would be individuals with partial fetal alcohol syndrome or ARND. And it does not matter the diagnosis, they tend to have very high rates of, um, of troubles with the law. It becomes even greater, though, in those individuals with the FAE, or where they don't have all of the physical features. So they're not being picked up and uh, noticed as having a disability uh, as readily. And so they are uh, more prone to having the troubles with the law kind of continue. They may still be getting into the same amount of troubles. Individuals with FAS may still be getting into the same uh, type of troubles, but um, possibly the individuals with FAS who have the physical features 
uh, people are recognizing that and so are less likely to pursue those charges so they're not actually uh, coming to full uh, 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 adjudication. In fact, in the work that I've been doing over the last uh, seven or eight years in uh, forensics and doing assessments of individuals uh, in the, uh, that have been uh, uh, charged with crimes, um, we have only seen a couple that were ultimately formally diagnosed with FAS. The majority were diagnosed with either a partial FAS or an ARND. So um, a lot of times people with FAS, uh, full FAS, are getting noticed earlier in the system, which is a good thing. The problem is those with ARND or partial FAS aren't being picked up and they still have the same cognitive impairments but uh, are kind of falling through the cracks, unfortunately. Um, so, turning away from the general population and looking in uh, forensic settings themselves, there have been a few, very few studies, uh, predominantly up in Canada, uh, that have looked at the prevalence of uh, FASDs in different settings. So, uh, the first was done by uh, Dr. Fast, Connery, and Locke. Uh, in a juvenile justice setting where these individuals were coming into the inpatient unit of the juvenile justice and they were diagnosing rates of about 23 percent of those individuals coming into that program were diagnosable with an FASD. Uh, in the probation program uh, up there, uh, this was a cross Canada uh, study that was done, um, I believe, uh, and they found that about four and a half percent of uh, the people in the probation program had been diagnosed, formally diagnosed, but an additional 26 percent that they hadn't been diagnosed, but it was certainly uh, strongly suspected. Um, and finally, the first study that, that I've seen in the adult population, in adult prisons, uh, this is a, a prison uh, outside of uh, Winnipeg, I believe, they found that the rate of FASDs was 10 times higher than it was in the uh, general population. So the rates in prison settings are extremely high. Why is FASD so relevant to, in court? The whole concept of, of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders is that when the mother drinks alcohol during pregnancy, that alcohol damages the development of the brain. And that damage to the brain can impact certain uh, cognitive skills such as executive functions. Executive functioning is a person's ability to uh, plan for things, their ability to um, delay reward. So if they really want something, they can um, postpone getting it until they've been able to complete other things. Uh, it's their ability to control impulses, which goes along with the, the delay and gratification, and making good decisions. And as we all know, individuals with FASD often have great difficulties with, with uh, all of these areas. Uh, one uh, person that I uh, remember from the past had uh, gone to a party, and she saw this, this lovely necklace at this friend's house or a friend's apartment, and she decided that she would take it. So she obviously was showing poor judgment in stealing that. Um, but then a couple of weeks later, she got invited back to the same party, and uh, she decided, you know, she really wanted to look really nice, so she wore that same necklace. And unfortunately, uh, she uh, was caught because of, of that second level of poor judgment. So sometimes it's not just the criminal act that is the problem, it's also the difficulty in being able to understand the consequences of those that come down the road. So that impairment can impact all of the aspects of um, legal involvement uh, for people with FASD. One of the big things that we've been concerned about uh, over the years is the issue of suggestibility. There have been a number of fairly uh, widely publicized cases of um, false confessions. Uh, there was one individual who uh, uh, confessed to an arson and uh, ended up in prison because of it. Uh, only several years later, to uh, it came to light that he wasn't even in the state at the time that the arson occurred. So individuals with FASD can be quite highly suggestible. And that's just in the general 
the settings, they tend to be suggestible. When you put them into settings where they are put under pressure by people, by people in authority, uh, such as police officers, they may have an even greater risk of um, basically uh, agreeing to what the police officers uh, say. And so they may tend to over uh, endorse, even uh, they may tend to um, admit to things that they did not do or admit to greater involvement in things than they actually were involved in. So maybe they were, let's say, driving the car uh, when his buddies went in and robbed the liquor store, um, but he, uh, through the interrogation, admitted that he was in there holding a gun and uh, things like that, so he over-endorses. And we know that this has been an, an issue with individuals with FASD. There have been a few studies of, uh, of FASD individuals with a particular scale called the Johnson Suggestibility Scale, which I use very routinely in FASD cases, because it is a test that looks at what we call interrogative suggestibility. So a person's um, uh, tendency to um, uh, be be led by questioning. So this test is a, it's a very interesting one. You, you read a story to the person, and then part of it is asking them to to tell the story back to you. So you check check their memory, but then you ask a number of questions about the story, and some of those questions are actually leading questions. They're not they're not real. And what you're trying to do is you want to see if a person uh, tends to be uh, swayed by those leading questions. Um, and uh, so that's, that happens on the first go around. And then you, you confront them and say, you know, you made a lot of mistakes here and we really need to get this right, so we need to go through it again. Standard practice in, a, in an interrogation is going over the story again and again. And we re-ask those same questions. And so what we're trying to see is do they change their uh, answers based off of this extra pressure. So this, uh, the uh, column on the right are a number of just control subjects, uh, normally developing individuals. The middle column was a study that was done um, back in the early 2000s, I believe, a uh, small study of just uh, individuals with FASD, these people were not involved with the law in any way. And then the far left study was one that uh, my group, FASD experts, had done as part of our, uh, our work with, uh, in forensic settings, a small number of individuals. And what you see is that as far as memory goes, individuals with FASD have much poorer recall of the story which is not unexpected. Uh, this is a very difficult story, and they need to organize information well, and organizing things is not something that uh, is something that, that people with FASD uh, can have uh, difficulties with. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, the suggestibility scale is the Good Johnson, and it's G-U-D-J-O-N S-S-O-N. It's a very difficult name, and I may have misspelled it again. Uh, the, the author of the study, uh, or the, the, the test, is actually a Finnish uh, person uh, who used to be a police officer and then uh, went on to uh, become a psychologist. And so developed this, this, uh, this test because he noticed that a number of people with uh, uh, cognitive challenges tended to have great difficulties in these, these sorts of settings. Um, so getting back here, um, yield one is when you first ask these leading questions, embedded leading questions, not all of them are, and you look to see how many they endorse. And individuals with FASD endorse about twice as many items as a control subject does. Um, and then when you go back through the, the uh, questions the second time, we're looking to see how often they change their story. So individuals that are just normally developing, they may change their, their uh, responses on average four out of the 20 questions. So four of the 20 questions they change on. But individuals with FASDs, regardless of whether they're a non-forensic non or a forensic sample, change their answers considerably more. Again, almost twice as often, uh, more than twice as often. So their overall suggestibility is significantly higher than individuals that are not exposed to alcohol prenatally. So um, 
one of the most important aspects of uh, when a person does come into contact with the law, uh, a person with FASD, is that they invoke their rights uh, to having an attorney or an advocate present so that they are less likely to end up in a situation where they're in an interrogation on their own and like and uh, prone to uh, uh, giving stories that or saying stories that are not necessarily accurate. So that's one of the the big issues that we get to. Um, now my background is in neuropsychology uh, in the diagnosis for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and other conditions. But what I look for in uh, a neuropsychological evaluation for anybody, but especially for individuals with FASD, is we're looking for patterns of strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so I create a chart of functioning of an individual. So this is one person that, that um, we evaluated uh, and uh, ended up going to trial with. Um, and what we've got here is uh, all of the testing that I gave broken out into different domains. So we've got IQ, academics, memory, attention, executive functioning, and adaptive skills. Um, one of the things that, that you'll find with uh, psychological and neuropsychological testing is that we've got a lot of scores, a lot of different types of scores. So an IQ test has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. But a, uh, some of these other tests have a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. So there's a lot of different scores. So what I tend to do is I actually convert all of the scores to one type of score, and it's called a z-score. And so that has a mean, or an average score, would be a zero. So if a person has an IQ of 100, that would convert to an, a score of zero on this scale. And it has a range of about one standard deviation, or one point in either direction. So I put that, I do that for everybody, all of the tests, and then I can compare across tests to look to see how a person is doing overall and in relation to other tests. What we often look for in individuals with FASD is we look for a, a, a couple of different patterns. One is that we're looking for deficits in multiple areas of functioning. Usually at least three different areas of functioning need to be uh, demonstrating impairment. And in this case we're seeing deficits in academics, memory, uh, certainly executive functions, and in all aspects of adaptive uh, functioning. Another thing that we're looking for is we're looking for kind of a, a, a pattern of descending functioning, where IQ tends to be a little bit higher than academic skills, which in turn tend to be higher than a person's adaptive skills. And so what, what we're looking at is kind of a disconnection between what a person knows and what a person is able to actually do or apply uh, independently. So that's what I do in a neuropsychological evaluation, looking for those strengths and weaknesses. But really, that's only one piece of the, of the puzzle. Because one of the things that we run into uh, in, when we're uh, testifying about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders is that the opposing attorneys will say, yeah, OK, fine, he's got these deficits. So what? What's the point? And that's where the other uh, uh, people involved in the diagnosis become much more uh, cr uh, critical. Because what you need to do in an assessment for FASD in the criminal justice system is you need to link up the diagnosis with the person's behavior and with the person's uh, behaviors uh, uh, that uh, got them into trouble with the law. And so we talk about this as being the nexus, the connection point between those things. So prenatal exposure leads to damage to the, uh, to the brain of the fetus. That leads to the cognitive behavioral deficits that I assess. But that also, so it, it leads to these problems in judgment, decision making, understanding, and applying cause and effect, and also impulse control, and that in, a, in, in turn leads to these instant behaviors. So 
for the individual that, that saw the, the pretty necklace. She made a bad decision, and because of her cognitive impairment, she made this bad decision and then uh, committed the crime. She saw it, she wanted it, and she got it. Um, so the nexus is basically talking about how the client's FASD impacts their behavior in life. And this is really critical because it talks to issues of um, capacity, their ability uh, to, um, to reason, to understand what's going on around them, and also it talks about mitigation issues. Uh, so uh, there are two, two uh, 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 things that, that the judge or jury takes into account uh, once a person has been uh, convicted of a crime. Uh, there are factors that are aggravators, things that make it worse. Um, so if a person carries a gun uh, into a, uh, when they do a robbery, that's an aggravating uh, incident. Um, but there can also be mitigate, mitigating uh, impacts. So a person that uh, was uh, under duress at the time that they were, uh, that they committed the crime, that could be a mitigator, mitigating factor. Let's say a person uh, shoplifted, but they, uh, had no income and they were trying to feed their family so they they stole uh, some food that can be taken into account as a mitigator and FASD can certainly be used as a mitigating uh, sort of uh, uh, argument um, so as we talked about right up front people with FASD we assume will have these impulsive illogical types of behaviors that often don't make sense so this was that same case uh, that I showed you, the chart of the neuropsychological functioning. So th this, these are some of his behaviors that occurred during the, the actual case. So he breaks into the house next door and shoots the neighbor, unfortunately kills her, and sets fire to the house. He goes back and forth to the house a bunch of times. Um, he lives next door, as I said. Uh, when somebody confronts him about this, he tells him who he is, his real name, shows him exactly where he lives. He goes to the gas station in the victim's car, buys gas. He goes through a speed, speed zone in the victim's car, gets caught, gives the officer his real name, gets a ticket for it. He watches the fire at the house uh, while the fire, fighters are there. Um, the next day he goes and um, tries to buy, uh, buys uh, items at uh, a, a store that he had actually interviewed in a few days ago using the victim's card. There are all of these things that he was doing that were very um, illogical. So one of the things that we see with individuals with FASD is when they do have troubles with the law, they usually are able to, at least to some level, plan what they're going to do, but they don't necessarily know how to uh, uh, follow through on the 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 offense or get themselves out of the situation once they get into it so they have no exit strategy and this one is this is a case where it, it was definitely showing that he was having significant problems with his exit strategy because he was making all of these mistakes that were pointing straight back at him uh, for this uh, 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 for this offense um, so kind of getting more into the practical side of things what should we be doing if uh, somebody with FASD does get into trouble with the law? The, there are two very important pieces. The first one is the attorney, and the second one are the experts. So the attorney. It's important to find one that is either familiar with FAS or is willing to learn about FASD. And then unfortunately there are a fair number of uh, attorneys that really aren't willing to learn about it. They usually will say, it can't have any impact. It doesn't really matter that this person has FASD. It's not a big deal. Or they'll say that really, it's going to be an aggravating thing. This guy has FASD. He can't learn. He's never going to um, be able to learn from uh, what has happened. So the jury or the judges is, is going to um, come down more harshly on the person. And unfortunately, that's uh, completely the opposite of the way that it really tends to work out, but it is definitely a misnomer uh, or a myth that uh, some of the some of the attorneys have had over the years that it really is going to be used as a bad thing. Um, one of the things that we always tell attorneys 
that we work with. And we work with a lot of attorneys that don't know anything about FASD at the outset of the, 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 the case. And as we go along through the case, we're educating them about what FASD is, what to expect with your, your person, uh, and things like that. And one of the things that we always are saying is, tell us all of the bad things that, that this person has done. Tell us all of the bad behaviors. Because those bad things are actually good from the perspective of being able to discuss the impact of the FASD on a person's behavior. So we tell them, don't be afraid of the bad things. They need to come out. We shouldn't hide them, or they shouldn't be hiding them. They need to come out so that they can then link all of that back to the FASD uh, to help to build a picture and to discuss the person's functioning uh, across the board. Um, and fairly recently, this was in 2012, the American Bar Association actually uh, put out a resolution acknowledging that all attorneys really and judges really need to pay attention to FASD. It is a big issue. Um, and so they've been making big pushes towards getting extra training uh, uh, about FASD uh, for uh, people involved in the justice system. And it's having an impact. Uh, many more attorneys that that are contacting us now do understand, at least on uh, a superficial level, about FASD and how that can be an important thing to pay attention to. Um, it's also something that's very important to pay attention to because uh, if they don't address it in a trial, it can then be used later uh, in coming back on either an appeal uh, by basically saying, well, the trial attorney didn't pay attention to it, and so he was not he or she was not being an effective uh, uh, counselor, and so uh, trials or uh, sentences can actually be overturned because of that or sent back for a retrial. So it's very important to keep uh, 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 for the attorney to pay attention to that, so that they are able to provide a uh, uh, important or, or sufficient defense for them. Um, so now it's becoming more uh, recognized by the uh, uh, people that work in the justice system. And so we're getting calls that are, are definitely much more um, knowledgeable. Uh, they are interacting with somebody with an FAS or somebody that they suspect has an FASD, and they're seeing these red flags, and they're contacting us or, or another uh, uh, provider to start addressing that. And of course, the critical piece is being able to uh, uh, come to a diagnosis and, un and not knowing about exposure history. Um, so the issues that uh, FASD can uh, be related to uh, as part of the, the criminal justice or the justice process, it can be, uh, uh, it can occur before the trial ever occurs, before it ever happens. So issues of competency to stand trial in the first place. Uh, people with FASDs oftentimes uh, have a great difficulties um, understanding the charges. They have a lot of difficulties being able to remember all of the people that are involved in the case, which is an important feature. And even more importantly, they often have a lot of difficulties being able to help their attorney. Um, and there are two aspects to, to competency to stand trial. One is understanding the uh, the uh, the charges and the system, and the other is being able to assist counsel. And I, oftentimes what I find even the most critical component of that is that ability to assist. And that's where the neuropsychology comes in because we're looking at their executive functions, their planning, their problem solving, their communication skills. Uh, individuals with FASD have a lot of difficulties with communication. So a lot of times it's really important for family members to be as involved as possible and helping the attorneys understand that, you know, John has a really hard time kind of following things. Uh, and so it needs to be broken down very, very concretely in little itty bitty chunks so that he can start understanding it. Um, so competency to stand trial, I think that it, although most people with FASD are adjudicated as being competent, quite frequently this happens. Um, because the the bar of, of competency versus incompetency is set very low. You, you can be very low functioning and still be uh, declared 
by, by a, a judge to be competent to stand trial. Um, but it's something that needs to be raised in every case. Um, you know, especially if you have an individual with FASD that has a lower IQ. You have basically a double whammy. A person with a low IQ or intellectual disability could be considered, could be competent to stand trial um, with proper help and assistance. But then when you add in uh, FASD to that mix, oftentimes it becomes much, much more difficult for them to be competent uh, to stand trial. Um, it's really important to understand and to get uh, 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 experts that are knowledgeable about FASD. A lot of neuropsychologists uh, that I interact with really have fairly little knowledge about FASD. And, um, you know, treat it as if, you know, yes, it's another type of cognitive impairment, um, but a lot of neuropsychologists are really trained more in the area of um, uh, looking at changes in functioning from a pre-morbid or a pre-damaged level or uh, time. Uh, we're oriented towards, pe towards assessing people that have traumatic brain injuries. So they're doing fine and then something happens. They get into a car accident and they hit their head very badly. And now we look at their functioning after that. The difference is with FASD, we never have that pre-morbid time. The damage is occurring early on in development. And so a lot of neuropsychologists aren't able, don't take into account that as well. So they have greater difficulties being able to do that. So finding experts that do understand and know about FASD is really important. Uh, issues of diminished capacity. Again, I think I talked about this a little bit earlier, um, that although the person may be competent, their ability to, um, uh, to understand right and wrong can have a significant impact uh, on their functioning. And so addressing issues of, capac of diminished capacity is often or usually critical. Um, sentencing, uh, issues of sentencing, we talked a bit about that as far as mitigation factors. It has been used very successfully as a mitigation factor. Um, that one case that uh, I told you about uh, uh, earlier, uh, the person was um, uh, being uh, tried as a capital offense, so he was facing the death penalty. And ultimately, the FASD, among other uh, factors, was uh, swayed the jury to the point where they uh, found him guilty of the, of the crime, but sentenced him to life without a possibility of parole. So it's a lesser uh, sentence from that perspective. Um, and then there's the issue of recidivism. If you are able to work with the court system to get uh, to to get alternative uh, sentencing, um, it's important to continue working with the individual and to continue this, the supports because uh, oftentimes individuals with FASD will do the same things over over and over again. Uh, it's not that they, they do this escalation, which we tend to see in, in some other types of crimes, um, where they start out at fairly petty things, and as time goes on, they start getting into more and more and more severe crimes. We don't usually see that with people with FASD, but they do tend to make, to do, to have those same uh, 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 criminal activity or crimes uh, that occur again and again. So it's really important with, uh, in order to kind of minimize that recidivism is to kind of work with the individual at uh, finding a higher structured environment once they are, uh, if they have been released from jails or prisons uh, but are still on parole or probation, they need to have a very structured, very uh, predictable environment. Um, Getting them into uh, services is going to be uh, critical. Uh, education, job training, uh, having the family involved in the case much more uh, is another uh, uh, very beneficial uh, piece of uh, trying to help an individual with FASD, um, both in showing to the court that he, has, he or she has the support outside so that they are less likely to commit crimes again. Um, but also in, in 
uh, showing the court that he has this support uh, uh, so that he's not being just kind of released into the wild as it were. One of the things about prisons, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword uh, because prisons are very highly structured environments. Uh, they know when they're going to get up, they know when they're going to eat, they know when they go to uh, programs. So it's extremely structured and a lot of times people with FASD can do really well in those settings because it is so predictable. The drawback, the downside, significant downside, is that they oftentimes tend to be very vulnerable to exploitation by others. And so individuals with FASD oftentimes uh, are, are victimized in, in prisons and jails. Um, there, over the years, there have been a number of different uh, uh, locations or locales where they've tried uh, using these uh, wallet cards, basically. So what we've got here is um, this little note that uh, the person with FASD is instructed, okay, if you get pulled over by the police for whatever reason, you hand them this card. Don't say anything to them. Just hand them the card. And so usually it's some variation of this. So I have a birth defect called fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, causes brain impairment. I need to, ha need to be able to contact somebody, and usually that contact person is listed on the card. And, you know, documenting that or stating that, you know, has problems with abstract concepts, has a hard time with legal rights, I could be really suggestible. Um, and so Tell, basically giving this spiel that they don't have to remember, they just hand it to the, the police officer so that the, um, they don't end up in situations where they're in an interrogation all on their own without an advocate or without an attorney present. Um, and where this has been done in a number of areas, it's actually gone quite well. And in fact, they, they got buy-in from, in this, this particular one was uh, in Juneau, they got buy-in from the, the police department. They were very happy to have this, uh, these cards uh, for individuals that had been diagnosed with FASD because then they're not in situations where they're um, basically convicting somebody wrongly. The police don't want to do that. They want to be able to get the correct person. So this was very beneficial for them as well. And so using these sorts of things uh, as family members can be very helpful. Um, so. I'm assuming that most the, the, the way that this webinar was set up was if my family member with FASD has been dying, has gotten into trouble with the law, what can we do? So there's so really what we're focusing on are those that have already been diagnosed. But if they haven't yet received a formal diagnosis, I know a lot of people that I've worked with, it's just been kind of assumed all these years. Yeah, he's got an FASD. We never really went and got it formally diagnosed, but, you know, it's it's there. That's not really going to work very well in court. Um, so if those are, if that's the sort of case, then getting a formal diagnosis is going to be important. And you can do a formal diagnosis any time during life. We've done evaluations on individuals in their 50s and 60s and given them a formal diagnosis. It obviously becomes much more difficult because you're trying to take into account all kinds of other life history events like head injuries, like drug and substance use, uh, and things like that. But it is certainly doable. So in those cases where um, the, formal eval the formal diagnosis is needed, you really need to involve a team uh, for the diagnosis. Doing the neuropsychological assessment that uh, uh, uses tests that research has shown to be sensitive to the impacts of alcohol, of prenatal alcohol. Um, and to look to see if the person's current pattern of functioning is consistent with the diagnosis. Then the medical assessment, the formal physical evaluation, taking measurements um, to, to see if a person has an FAS or a partial FAS. Oftentimes, I've, historically, I've commented that really the facial features of FASD don't matter much from the perspective of an individual with any form of FASD, whether they have physical features or not, have the very similar or very same cognitive impairment, so they have the same difficulties functioning. But when you get into the legal setting, having those physical features can be very useful because then the, the 
the doc, the medical doctor who makes the formal diagnosis can say, okay, yes, there are all these other issues going on. He, the person did have troubles with substances over the years. They have had a couple of hits to the head. But this person has some physical features that are consistent with FAS. They have smaller eyes. They have a smooth, uh, a smooth filtrum. And that's not caused by any of those other things. It can be caused by the alcohol. So they can then make that differential diagnosis, which then helps very much um, pardon me, for the, uh, the, uh, in the court setting. Having said that, individuals with ARND, without any physical features, we've been, uh, we've been involved in a number of cases that way and have still been able to make the formal diagnosis, and it has been beneficial that way. And then finally, as I, as I kind of have alluded to along the way, having this historical psychosocial assessment to look at that nexus is absolutely critical so that, they, so that basically the attorney can say, so what? This is why it's important. If a diagnosis has already been made in the past, critical thing is get all of the records about that diagnosis. Have everything there so that you know exactly who did it, when they did it, what the specific diagnosis was. Um, because again, that's important to document uh, that, that it was formally made. And in fact, in some ways, it can be even more beneficial because it's this diagnosis was made before, maybe before Johnny ever got into trouble with the law. So it's not, you might say, open quotes, tainted by a biased expert. This is something that's been there all along. Um, the neuropsych evalu neuropsychological evaluation may be important or may not be important. To some extent, it depends on how recently any testing had been done. Um, if nothing had been done for a long time, it might be useful to have that neuropsych, but still, finding the psychologist to do that assessment for that nexus, the connection between the FASD and the behavior is the critical piece. That, that really needs to be there, regardless of whether there's any uh, new neuropsychological or cognitive testing that's done. So kind of one of the important messages to take home is that Having an FASD does not excuse a person's behavior. It does not mean that they should uh, not be punished for it. But it, what it does is it explains their behavior in the context of the damage that's occurred to them that's outside of their own control. This happened before they were born. And thus it um, allows or, or um, requires us to argue for alternatives to uh, uh, more stringent or stiffer uh, sentencing or punishments. So as I've said all along, FASD should be considered as a mitigating factor in these cases. And alternatives could include, I don't know in the areas where you all are, if they have mental health courts or drug courts, um, but Washington certainly has both of those. And those are types of uh, court programs, they're diversion programs, where the person is involved in uh, treatment during the course of uh, their court involvement. So they're not necessarily, uh, they're not uh, imprisoned during this time, but they're in the community getting services th that they need. And so being able to try, trying to get a person diverted into those drug or mental health courts can be very beneficial for them. Because those courts are set up less in a punitive way and more in a collaborative way. You go in every week, you talk to the judge, you say what sorts of things have been going on, the judge listens to that. If a person does, you know, is doing, uh, uh, is breaking their parole or probation, then yes, they, they get punished for that, but uh, the rest of the time they're trying to work with them to try and help them achieve their goals so that they can then get off of the services later. So having those court ordered uh, mental health or substance treatment programs can be very important. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult for a person to find those services on their own, and so having it court ordered can sometimes help kind of kickstart the system to get them into it. Placement in other settings other than jails or prisons, like halfway houses or therapeutic group homes, can be very important because in these settings, 
the person gets a lot of supervision. There's somebody there monitoring their behavior, keeping track of their movements. In some of the group homes, they're also getting uh, therapeutic services. So they're getting all these all the supports to try and help them learn more appropriate behaviors, but they're also protecting society by monitoring and uh, structuring their environment so that they're not uh, uh, independently uh, going out on their own all the time. And so they're able to kind of uh, put that as a safeguard for the community, because that's ultimately what the court has to decide. Is this person safe to be back in the community? And so having these settings where they're able to say, yes, this person is in a position where they're not a danger to society, then they may be able to get into these, these more less restrictive environments. Electronic monitoring or in-home uh, uh, house arrest can be very helpful, especially in families that are very involved and can provide that monitoring. I uh, have had a number of cases where that's essentially what has happened. He's been uh, uh, part of the, the uh, sentencing was that they had essentially 24-7 monitoring line of sight with the individual, except when he was asleep. And even then, the windows were locked, so he couldn't leave. Um, and, uh, and he was basically at home unless he was out with somebody else or uh, at work. So those sorts of uh, situations can work quite well. Um, also, uh, developmental disability administration. So getting a person involved in DDA, or that's, that's what we call it here in, in Washington State, but the Division of Developmental Disabilities, can also help the court to understand that, yes, this person is going to be getting services, they're going to be supported, and they're going to be monitored. Because DDA can provide some of these sorts of group home settings and, and uh, uh, therapeutic interventions that uh, may be necessary. So getting a person uh, approved for DDA uh, while they're in the process of the, of the court proceedings can really help the judge in, uh, or the jury in making decisions as to whether uh, they can uh, use a, a lesser restrictive uh, environment for the person. So um, I'm going to end my presentation there. I've got a list of resources here. Uh, the first set of resources are kind of general knowledge about uh, FASD and about uh, legal justice issues. The second set are uh, getting the forensic diagnosis, uh, if need be. Um, the group that I work with, FASD experts, but there are other people around the country that do evaluations for FASD in uh, 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 criminal uh, situations or forensic situations. Dr. Chasnoff over in Chicago has been doing this for many, many years. And Dr. Woods down in uh, San Francisco or North Bay area of, of California has been doing this, this sort of work also. Um, and another thing that you can do as far as the finding the attorneys, as I said, there are a number of attorneys that are extremely knowledgeable about FASD. Um, there's one in Oregon that uh, uh, is extremely good, Karen Steele. Um, another uh, uh, um, attorney down in California, um, Billy Edwards. Um, they took it upon themselves to become experts themselves in FASD. And so contacting somebody like that to say, OK, here's my situation. Do you have any attorneys in my area that you would recommend? You can do something like that. Or contacting one of the, the diagnostic experts and say that and ask the same question. And we can talk about attorneys that we've worked with in the past that have become more experts with FASD. So kind of pulling your resources to try and find those attorneys, because that's the first step. And it's a very critical one. So at this point, I will open it up to questions. Um, and I believe that Andy's going to uh, read them off for me or something. Yeah, hi, this is Andy Catcher again at NoFast. Thanks, Paul. That was a really great presentation. And again, uh, just to remind everyone, the video recording of the presentation of this webinar will be made available on the NoFast website uh, within 24 hours. Also, some people were asking about slides. And as Paul said, uh, there will be uh, some of the slides will be made available on the NoFast website as well. 
Uh, so, yeah, there was actually a lot of questions, so I'm just going to get right to it, uh, just to ask those of Paul. And uh, some of the longer questions or some of the more involved questions, we might not, might not have time to get to all of them. Um, so I'm going to uh, email um, Paul with uh, those questions, and, and he uh, you know, can respond uh, directly to some of those people at a later time. So uh, let's see, one of the questions was asking about the suggestibility scale. Uh, does the scale have good psychometric qualities? Um, yes, it, it was. Uh, it's a it's a test that's that's well used. It's well respected. It uh, meets those sorts of criteria for admissibility into court. Um, I've never been challenged on it when I have testified to it. So that's from the one perspective of admissibility. But it also um, it had a, a very good normative sample, albeit most of the sample were um, Brits, because uh, he developed the test over in England, and it's actually published in England. So there is some issues that way. But there are also norms that have been developed uh, here in, in the United States. So you can use either the original norms out of the, the, the manual, or you can use uh, some of these other published norms that have been out there. So it does have quite good uh, psychometric uh, parameters. All right, great, thank you. Another person asked, is FASD considered a disability according to ADA standards? Um, I'm not sure about it on a federal level, to be honest with you. Um, with the de developmental disabilities programs, those are usually uh, run on a state-by-state -state basis. And most of the states that I have worked with do consider FASD to be a developmental disability. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, however, they often are requiring more than just having the diagnosis. You need to have the diagnosis and be able to document significant uh, impairments in intellectual and adaptive functioning. So not everybody with FASD would qualify, but having an FASD would put you in the in the in the on the list of, of being able to essentially potentially qualify. All right, great, thanks. And uh, there were some people asking about, you were talking about attorneys and the importance of getting an attorney that is knowledgeable about FASD or that's willing to learn about FASD. And is there a list of those attorneys? Or if you live in a small town, for example, uh, how do you go about finding an attorney that can help you or that is knowledgeable? Yeah. Oh, that's, I mean, those are great questions. I don't know that there is a specific list, but um, what I'll do is when I uh, email out the, the um, slides, I'll add in a couple of other people that uh, could be contacted uh, about f finding an attorney in your area. Um, one of the people is uh, uh, here at the the UW Fetal Alcohol Drug Unit Legal Issues Resources, um, Kay Kelly, has been working with uh, legal issues uh, kind of as a uh, facilitator for many years now. And she knows a lot of people that are attorneys uh, in different parts of the country that, that may work with that. So contacting her and saying, hey, I live in Oklahoma. Do you know any, any attorneys there? Uh, she may be able to provide that information to you. It also may be that in some of these rural areas, you just aren't going to be able to uh, find somebody that knows about FASD, and that's okay. A lot of the people that I've worked with in my in the forensic forensic cases that I've done, they didn't know about FASD beforehand, and they would ask questions that I would kind of go, "Oh gosh, that's kind of a odd question to ask about it." But throughout the course of the case, we were educating them as much as we were making a diagnosis for the individual, if it was appropriate. And so by the end of the process, they were much more knowledgeable about FASDs. Um, so having an attorney, even if they don't know about FASD, that is willing to ask the questions of somebody that does, that's a big key. Um, so they can then con reach out to some of these other attorneys around the country that have done these cases before and talk to them about this, the this, the, the pitfalls and the, the good things that they can do uh, in, uh, in their process of the, of the case. 
All right, great, thanks. And I'll also add, uh, NOFAS has a list of resources uh, on our resource directory that has a, a map, a state by state resource directory, uh, many of which include diagnostic resources. And also, you can contact NOFAS uh, through the website as well if you'd like more information. Uh, and somebody asked, uh, how about uh, determining diagnosis um, if the maternal consumption of alcohol during pregnancy is unknown? That is the, the grail. Um, we have, there's only the one case, the one type of case where a diagnosis could be made. And that's if a person has all of the physical features of FASD in addition to the neuropsychological cognitive impairments. Um, and that's the only time that we can make the diagnosis. Sorry. Um, so in those cases, you know, you may end up not being able to. Uh, make a diagnosis, but the experts can then say, well, on a more likely than not basis, if we knew about the exposure, this person's behavior would be very consistent with it. We can't make the diagnosis, but, you know, it's sort of quacking like a duck. Uh, and if it's quacking like a duck, it very well might be a duck. Uh, so you may not be able to make the formal diagnosis, but you can raise that awareness to the judge and the jury that it is very highly suspected and that maybe we will be able to find out information at some point, maybe not. Uh, in some cases, we never are able to. But it can still be used, the behaviors and the cognitive impairments, and being able to show that these cognitive impairments and behaviors have been present throughout their lives and as such are more developmental in nature can still be used uh, uh, to address issues of diminished capacity and for mitigation in, um, in these cases. So having the diagnosis is extremely valuable, but not having the diagnosis doesn't mean that the information isn't important and very important and beneficial. All right, great, thanks. And I will note that it is now 3 o'clock when the webinar was scheduled to run till, but we, uh, if it's okay with Paul, uh, we could time to go through a few more uh, questions. There's a lot of questions, uh, so I'm going to, you know, we won't have time to get through all of them, but I'm going to email those again to the presenter, Paul, to uh, to get back to some of them. But uh, just to run through a couple of the uh, the other questions, one is the regarding the wallet cards. Mm -hmm. um, somebody was asking, what if an affected individual refuses to use that because they won't acknowledge that they need help, they won't acknowledge that they have FASD? Yeah. Um. That's always going to be a challenge. I run into that very frequently clinically. Um, just individuals that, that I would diagnose with FASD, but they don't want to take advantage of services that could be very helpful for them. And ultimately, it is, you know, unless they are found to be not competent, um, ultimately, it, it kind of is their decision if they're an adult. Uh, and unfortunately, it may be a bad decision, and it could be, you know, something that is very much emblematic of the underlying cognitive problems that they have, um, that they're not able to make those good decisions. Um, that doesn't preclude family members from, once they find out about, you know, Johnny getting into trouble with the law, calling and pestering the attorney. Um, you know, moms and dads don't have any HIPAA rules. They can divulge whatever they need to divulge. Um, doesn't mean that the, and they don't have privacy rules that they need to follow uh, by the law. The attorneys may, they may not be able to share with you, but you can certainly share with them. All right, great, thanks. I'm just going through some uh, of the additional questions. Um, let's see, one was, let's see, uh, in terms of recent evaluations, is there any sort of, um, timeline or in terms of how many years uh, the evaluation can be in the past in terms of being accepted in court? Um, I don't think that there's any specific timeline. You know, I'm, I'm usually, because my work involves doing evaluations in adults. I, I'm, I don't work with little kitties. Um, so if there has been an, an assessment that's been done in the last, you know, maybe five, ten years or even in a lot of these cases, a lot of testing had been done uh, as part of an earlier part of the 
trial or the or the the case. So let's say I'm seeing these people after conviction, they're appealing the conviction or asking for relief from that uh, from the sentencing. So there may have been testing done, you know, five, ten years ago. And so on a case by case basis, I may not need to give all of the same tests. Having said that, in almost every case, um, they haven't given all the tests that I would usually give uh, for FASD uh, issues. And so uh, some important aspects of functioning like receptive communication skills or um, really in-depth assessment of, of uh, executive functioning, they just didn't do as part of the original evaluation. And it's not saying that they did a bad evaluation, it's just that they weren't necessarily doing an evaluation that was um, focused on the issues of FASD. They were doing a general neuropsych, see kind of how he was doing across a broad spectrum. Um, so in those cases, there's oftentimes a need for at least some testing. Uh, one of the things that we do see with individuals with FASD is that there tends to be a lot of variability of functioning over time. So sometimes uh, I repeat the tests anyway because there may be a history of scores that kind of are bouncing around when they're little. Um, and so relying just on some testing that was done eight years ago, let's say, and they're now 40, um, I want to do that testing again maybe because I want to see where they're functioning now. Uh, and look at that variability over time because that's something that we can use diagnostically. Even if they did fairly good when they were 32, uh, if they're not doing well now, that's another diagnostic red flag that we can look at. All right, thank you. Um, and I don't know how much time you happen to have. If you wanted to just go a few more minutes uh, longer or what you were we can, thinking. We can go until a quarter after is fine. Okay. Um, so another question was, does any of your advice change if the offense is uh, sexual in nature? Is there a nexus between that offense and FASD? It doesn't change uh, if it's a sexual offense. Uh, in fact, one of the members of the team that I work with, Dr. Uh, Natalie Novick-Brown, that's her other area of specialization is in, um, uh, in sexual offenses and sexually violent predators. And so, and it's something that we do run into fairly frequently are, are sex offenses. Uh, so no, it doesn't change any of those, any of those things. It's still uh, bad impulsive behaviors. Unfortunately, it's, it's another crime against persons that can be, uh, you know, damaging, very damaging to the victim. Um, but it doesn't change the approach. Thanks. And Somebody was asking, as far as trainings, um, can trainers in FASD uh, be effective in doing trainings for police, justice department, attorneys, any suggestions in, in that area? Uh, we certainly have been doing a lot of that as much as possible. Um, you know, uh, a number of us, you know, not just my FASD experts team, but um, Dr. Chasnoff, I know, has given talks around the country. Dr. Woods uh, has been uh, out there doing these sorts of things. So going to legal conferences, both prosecution and defense, because uh, my work is not solely with defense. I do work for prosecution too. Uh, oftentimes in those cases, they tend to be victims in the crime that I'm evaluating. But uh, raising the awareness for, uh, for FASD on both sides of the aisle and with judges is very important, and we try and do that as much as possible. All right, thank you. And um, are there any sort of documents uh, available to supply to mental health courts uh, for inclusion of FASD or NDPAE or another uh, FASD-related diagnosis into mental health courts, um, some of which uh, this person is saying is currently denying FASD clients? Ooh, um, interesting. There have been a couple of... Well, as far as the mental health courts go, they may not be getting in on FASD itself directly, although the court needs to know about it because they need to alter their approach somewhat because people with FASDs need the extra supports and extra structure that a person with other types of mental health Im impairments or mental health uh, 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 dysfunction or disorders 
may not have problems with. But um, you know, the, the research shows that 95% of people with FASD also have a diagnosable mental health condition. Um, and so looking to get them into the program based off of the mental health uh, diagnoses can be very important. And now with the NDPAE being in the DSM-5, there may be, and it's only fairly recently, in the last year or two, that that's been there, um, there may be a move towards accepting people into uh, mental health courts uh, that have been diagnosed with the NDPAE, but that's still in its infancy because a lot of uh, uh, government agencies haven't started using DSM-5 yet. They're still using DSM-4. Uh, so that may be a transition that will be coming down the road within the next couple of years. But getting them the services through the other conditions, a lot of people with FASD have severe or significant uh, depression or uh, bipolar-like symptoms or uh, psychotic type symptoms. Uh, I think in, in one study that, that we did or that was done at, at the unit, uh, we found about 40% of people with FASDs had some form of diagnosable psychotic condition. So getting them into the programs based off of those sides of things and then educating the, the, the court about the FASD in addition to that. Great, thank you. And as far as um, children or adolescents with FASD, um, somebody was asking if they can benefit from being in the structure of a juvenile justice system. Um, the structure can be very beneficial, yes. The problem is still with all, all justice systems, whether it be juvenile or adult, is that there is increased risk of uh, victimization in those settings. So um, it could be that a juvenile setting is very beneficial from that structure perspective. Um, but it's also very important that they are uh, monitored and uh, uh, placed in units, let's say, where they're not as prone to victimization. So sometimes placing them in uh, uh, special offender units where they're getting more treatment in the programs, uh, mental health type of treatment, things like that, where it's more of a supportive milieu than a standard general population. Um, if you know if if being placed in a juvenile facility is kind of the the only alternative, uh, trying to find those sorts of placements within the justice system can be very helpful. All right, thank you. And somebody was asking about: uh, Does someone uh, with FASD have the ability to understand the terms of their parole, or are there issues with that? Definitely, there can be issues with that. Um, Understanding in general, regardless of what the setting is, um, and the ability to kind of understand what's said to them uh, is difficult for people with FASD. Uh, and when they get into the parole probation sort of a setting, oftentimes the, the parole officers have a massive caseload. So they're not going to be able to you know, uh, uh, hold your hand, hold the person's hand, and provide a lot of that structure. Um, so they will give the information that needs to be given, tell them this is, these are your requirements, you have to be here at 5 o'clock every day, et cetera, et cetera. But if there's no follow-up to that, it's going to be very difficult oftentimes for people with FASD to follow those requirements. And unfortunately, then they get uh, uh, um, uh, sent back to jails or prisons because they've violated their parole for usually very mild things or minimal things, but it's technically breaking the rules. So trying to work with the parole officers, the community uh, service officers, to understand FASD, and we have done uh, trainings for parole probation, so that if they know that there's a person coming through with an FASD, then they know that they need to spend a little extra time or recruit more assistance from the community in order to help them. So it could be family members, it could be friends, uh, it could be uh, uh, other people 
that this person uh, interacts with that serves as that kind of reminder to make sure that they are following the rules. All right, great, thank you. And there are a few other questions, um, but in the interest of time and, uh, and everything, I'm going to send those uh, additional questions, um, some of which are more involved, more uh, people sharing their personal stories, that sort of thing, uh, wanting some specific answers. I'm going to share those directly with uh, our presenter, and, um, and he'll get back to you on those. And um, again, a reminder that the recorded webinar will be available, uh, in addition to the slides, uh, will be available on the NOFAS website. And uh, I'd like to thank Paul very much um, uh, for the webinar presentation, uh, Dr. Paul Connor. And uh, I hope that people found it uh, informative, useful. I think there was a lot of really great information uh, provided. And again, uh, if you go to the NOFAS website, www.nofas.org, there's a list of other webinars, uh, recorded webinars, a lot of information. NOFAS, uh, the NOFAS website actually has a whole web page devoted to uh, these issues, criminal justice system issues. And there's a resource directory of state-by-state uh, -state resources. You can contact NOFAS for more information. And you can uh, follow NOFAS on social media, on our Facebook page, our Twitter account, and so forth. And uh, again, I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, Paul very much. Uh, and is there, is there anything else that you would like to add in closing? Well, i just really like to thank NOFAS and, and Andy for all the work that you guys have done over all these years working with people with FASD and raising the awareness. Um, because having that macro level where you guys are off in D.C., talking with people and raising the awareness uh, is really important for getting it down to the grassroots. You know, the American Bar Association, really, their, their resolution uh, was because of all of these organizations working together, including NOFAS, to try and get the awareness raised. And that's just critical. And I really appreciate you guys doing that. All right. Thank you. Well, we appreciate all your work as well. And uh, thank you, everybody. And um, this concludes uh, this edition of the, the NOFAS webinar series. And uh, you're welcome to uh, get more information at nofast.org and more information from FASD experts as well. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, guys.